Good afternoon. Um, if we could get started, it would help because um, this is really your chance to talk to us. Um, but first, I want to go over a few things and then uh, introduce a few people. First, I'd like to introduce several people in the audience who are members of the legislature. First, David Zuckerman, who is from Burlington, introduced one of the bills on legalization. David, thank you for coming down to Bennington County. We have Representative Tim Corcoran, Representative Kaya Morris. Um, do we have any other representatives here? Bill Botza. How could I miss the tallest representative in the state? <laughs> Vermont State House, and Senator Brian Campion, most of you know from Bennington. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Dick Sears, State Senator, Bennington County, and Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, but first, uh, Senator White from Wyndham County, Senator Ash from Chittenden County, and Senator Ash also chairs the Finance Committee, which will be the next step on the road if the bill passes out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Joe Benning from Caledonia County is the Vice Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And Senator Alice Nitka from Wyndham County is our clerk and timekeeper and expert on all rules. The Senate Committee on Judiciary is holding these hearings for the purpose of hearing from Vermonters with their thoughts on possible legalization of marijuana and the regulation. This continues the General Assembly as a whole. This committee and the General Assembly as a whole has been examining legal treatment of marijuana for some time. Um, we passed medical marijuana laws in 2004. Um, and in 2011, the legislature authorized medical marijuana dispensaries. In 2013, the legislature decriminalized the possession of amounts of small amounts of marijuana under one ounce. We have been taking a measured approach to, in the past and will continue to do so in exploring the appropriate state response to the personal use of marijuana by adults. There are currently two bills in the Senate Judiciary Committee, S95, Senator Zuckerman's bill, and S-241, Senators White and Benning are the sponsors of that bill. You're, as witnesses, you're welcome to comment on these specific proposals or address other issues related to marijuana. If, and I'm going to emphasize that if, if the committee decides to move forward with proposed a proposal for legislation and our legalization and regulation, such a proposal would need to address the five principles cited by Governor Shumlin in his State of the State Address. Those are keeping marijuana and drugs out of the hands of underage kids, Impu imposing a tax low enough to uh, wipe out the black market, um, using our tax revenue. I'm going to have to put on my glasses. using the tax revenue from legalization to expand drug prevention programs, strengthening law enforcement's capacity to improve the response to impaired drivers under the influence of marijuana who are already on Vermont's road, and banning the sales of edibles into the other states how to figure to do it right. We would ask our witnesses to keep their comments under three minutes so that we can hear from all of those of you who signed up, and we'll do our best. We're going to have to end at 2.30 because we're heading to Brattleboro and then to Springfield this afternoon. So uh, Senator Benning is going to read two names. The first name would come up to the podium and speak, and the other name could sit up here, and they're kind of on deck. Um, and those of you who are Red Sox fans knows what that means. So thank you very much. Tell them about the 30 seconds. Or oh, and Senator Nitka will show you a sign when it's 30 seconds left. And hopefully you will um, finish up at that point so that we can hear from everybody. This is not an interactive forum per se. But if people have questions or if you don't get heard, feel free to send us emails at the State House. And we will read them over, and they'll be part of the record. Thank you very much. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joe Benning, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here in Bennington, where I hope you all know how to spell my name. Um, I'm going to be reading names, and as we go and we listen to everybody, some of you may realize once you've heard somebody else testify that what you're going to say is exactly the same thing. And should that happen and you decide you want to pass, just yell out pass as I call your name so we can move things along and try to get everybody in that wants to be heard. So first is John Zink from Bennington. Loyal Westcott, you are on deck, as they say. Oh, and I should also add, if you happen to have one of these, if you could put it on airplane mode, we'd be most appreciated. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Zink. I was the under sheriff here in Bennington County for 17 years. During that particular time, I also served as a drug and alcohol awareness officer and was the co-coordinator of the state of Vermont's DARE programs. Um, one of the things I'm not going to do is talk about anything I am not expertise in. But one of the things I am relatively knowledgeable about is the fact that we have a serious drug problem here in our state and here locally in our county. We also have had in the past a, seri a serious drinking problem amongst young people. During the 1980s, when I was a patrol officer here in the Bennington Police Department, I personally investigated over nine deaths in one year in this state, all juveniles, all motor vehicle accidents. I, for the life of me, cannot understand how we can possibly regulate the use of marijuana amongst teenagers. I, I know that we're going to make every effort. I respect the fact that you have complete confidence that you're going to try to do this, but there is a reality of things, folks. And I've seen that reality over 30 years. I've been in the trenches. I've been behind a desk. I've taught at the police academy. I have worked throughout the state setting up, training teachers, training police officers in regards to these topics. And it is one of the issues that I know is a very dark place. The other problem is the black market here in this state. I personally investigated drug sales. I personally investigated people who are involved in the black market here. And one of the things I know is there is a tremendous group of people in this state who grow and cultivate marijuana for, i.e., their own personal use as well as for consumption by others, but whether it be friends, relatives, or people they sell these drugs to. And this is not something that's going to be easily controlled. One of the things I think you're all aware of as officials of this state is the fact that we have a very limited amount of criminal justice personnel here to manage this, and it isn't getting any better. I would hope that you would consider this, not necessarily to not ever allow this, but to take some time to step back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Loyal Westcott and Arthur Peterson, you are on deck. Before Loyal starts, I just want to recognize Representative Alice Miller from Shaftesbury, who just arrived. Hello, my name is Loyal Westcott, and I reside in Bennington. And I know there's a lot of people that's for marijuana recreational use. But I would ask that you guys go back, and I don't know if you can get records, how many ended up with paranoid schizophrenia, how many ended up with black lung disease, how many people ended up with COPD, and also if you do legalize it, mandate that they cannot smoke in a house where there is kids. If so, make it an automatic felony because you can get a contact high from marijuana. I'd ask that you look at the pros and the cons because I got a girlfriend that died at 18. The guy was drunk and drugged up. It threw her out of the car, the car laying on top of her. And if you remember New York State, as soon as they decriminalized it, Dennis Drew killed two people high on marijuana. I don't want the same thing to happen when they legalize alcohol, seeing how much money they can make, and now millions of people are dead because they legalized it. And the other problem I have, they're going to be like cigarettes and alcohol. You're going to have your adults out there buying it for the kids. It's going to be easier for them to get than it is now. So I'd ask that you look at all that in consideration before you just go ahead 
and legalize marijuana. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Arthur Peterson, John Skult, you are on deck. Folks, thanks for this opportunity to speak with you. I appreciate the opportunity to come here as a, as a citizen and talk. Uh, I've thought long and hard about what to say here. Um, I, I'm dead set against any attempt to legalize marijuana. Um, I think I'll, I'll just talk about health and safety. This state prides itself in being a healthy state and an extremely safe state. Okay, most people I think in this room would get, would agree that our crime rate is relatively low our, and our people are healthy, our people are active, our people are outside. So what will this legalization potentially do to the health and safety of our state? If you used a Colorado example, uh, when they legalized, I, I don't know exactly the year, but since they've legalized, a number of things have happened in Colorado. There's been a big increase in traffic fatalities with links to marijuana. The drivers linked to marijuana, traffic fatalities have gone way up since legalization of marijuana. ER visits, emergency room visits have gone way up in Colorado since legalization of marijuana. All related to, ER visits related to marijuana have gone way up, that's what I mean to say. Increase in marijuana use between, in kids between 12 and 17. The opposite of what we're trying to do has happened. That's increased, not decreased. So if we think that legalization is going to stop marijuana use in kids, we're, we're wrong. It, it just will not. And there's even been an increase, and it's very predictable, in exposure to marijuana in children uh, under, under 10 years old. Okay, my biggest fear in this is not necessarily the 21-year-old trying marijuana. My problem with this is the 35-year-old parent in his home with two children smoking marijuana regularly. What does that tell those kids? I'll tell you what it tells them. This is okay, and I want to do that when I get older. That's what it tells them. If we bring big marijuana in here, and that's what these companies are, big marijuana, okay, they're going to sell this and market it. They want to see a year-to-year -year increase in revenue. What do you think that's going to get down to? They're going to be pushing it on our kids. If you don't think it, I think you're wrong, okay? A couple of years ago, I was a head high school football coach here in Vermont. I coached the Miller River Minutemen. Um, I know there are kids who, who dropped out of our program, who were all gung-ho, got involved with drugs, and dropped out. And it's a terrible thing to see. Also, as a young second lieutenant in Germany, I pulled a guy out of a window who was high on drugs. And, and it left, the, left a lasting impression. I ask you to re reconsider what you're trying to do here as a citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. John Skultz. Brad Meyerson, you're on deck. John here. Did we mispronounce the name? I have S C U L T. All right, Brad. All right. Thank you. And who's on deck? Dick Daly, you're on deck. Right. Senator Sears, thank you, uh, Senators uh, Senator Spending and Senator White. Thank you so much for this bill, which I fully support and is long overdue. Um, I want to, in my brief time, address what the gentleman who spoke before me just said. Uh, it is characteristic of a lot of misinformation that is being peddled by the prohibitionists. Uh, based upon what I've read in newspaper articles and online, there has been no explosion of teen marijuana use in Colorado. There has been no explosion in emergency room fatalities. There has been no exponential increase of traffic accidents in Colorado. In fact, if you look at the statistics, there has been a negligible change in traffic accidents or fatalities in Colorado as a result of legalization. I want to talk to the issue of drug driving because it's something that I do have a little bit of experience in defending drug drivers. Uh, I've been doing DUI defense and drug driving defense for about 33 years now. And I can tell you that we do not have a problem in Vermont with drug driving. We will not have future problems with drug driving. 
if marijuana is legal, because enough people smoke marijuana today, whether it's legal or not, it's not going to change their driving habits. And I can also tell you that it is not necessary, as many people in law enforcement and uh, others are saying, that as a quid pro quo for legalization, we need to give police new tools to fight drug driving. My experience has been that what we have today is sufficient. We have something called DRE, Drug Recognition Evaluation, all right? Now, office, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to train law enforcement on how to administer those tests and score them. We spend a lot of money training our police officers on how to recognize roadside symptoms of impairment. I can tell you from defending drug driving cases that if a police officer pulls somebody over, sees glassy eyes or smells marijuana, orders the person out of the car, there is a presumption that that person is under the influence. And everything that the officer does at that point, traditional DUI enforcement tests such as uh, field exercises, eye tests and things like that, those are sufficient to determine if somebody preliminarily on the side of the road is under the influence of driving, uh, driving under the influence of marijuana or some other drug, in addition to a breath test result, a roadside breath test result of zero. It is not necessary to have roadside saliva testing. The problem of drug driving in Vermont is not so pervasive that, first of all, it's going to change if marijuana is legalized. Law enforcement has enough tools, and rather than giving them more tools, what we need to do is make sure that officers are properly trained in drug recognition evaluation uh, policy so that when someone is arrested and there is probable cause for arrest, that they are trained, that they, they do the testing properly. And even though my personal opinion is those tests are ridiculous, that's what we have, that's what the legislature said we should follow. We will not have an explosion of DUI drug driving in Vermont with legalization because enough people smoke already, whether it's legal or not. So. Again, thank you, Senator White, uh, Senator Ash, for this bill. I I'm very much hope it passed, and thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Dick Daly. <laughs> Sue Sweeney is on deck. Hello, my name is Dick Daly. I appreciate the few minutes to voice my opinion. I'm sorry if I don't come across very coherent. I'm not used to public speaking, but I feel very compelled to say something here to you gentlemen and ladies today. My family and I strongly oppose any legislation at this time. We think that you're moving fast. These may be good things. I've read some good things that could come of it, but I see too many negative things that could affect school, kids, learning. That's, in our opinion, it is a huge thing. You looked at something called the RAND study, you paid to have a RAND study done, it was done out of California, and they <coughs> did use uh, some of the federal government's uh, studies, however they overlooked the National Institute on Drug Abuse pertaining to how does marijuana use affect school work and social life. And if I could read you just a, a short excerpt from it, it says research has shown that marijuana's negative effects on attention, memory, and learning can last for days or weeks after acute effects of the drug wear off. Depending on the user's history, of course, uh, in the lag time. But however, this study alludes to the fact that the kids are lethargic in school. How can we expect our teachers and evaluate our teachers, especially with this common core stuff coming, the burden that we put on to our educators, when we have introduced this into society. Now this is a very concealable drug. Kids, I smoked it when I was in high school, loved it, I could get my hands on it. These poor law enforcement people, they couldn't stop us. And I understand, <clears throat> I understand today that you're trying to look at alleviating that in the black market, but it still will find its way into the schools somehow. Also, <clears throat> through these studies, it also has shown that, <clears throat> I can't say it quite right, but I'm gonna to try to say it, that those who have had long-term exposure, even whether it be minimal or maximized, when they reflect back on their accomplishments in life, they are not happy with themselves and what they have tried to accomplish, and they feel that this has dragged them down. So, 
and that is in the National Institute of Drug Abuse pertaining to use of marijuana. You can find that. It's a, national, it's a federal government thing. You can find that. So, anyways, I again would like to thank you for a minute to comment. Uh, I am a fourth generation Vermonter, and and I I just don't like the direction that we're headed. I don't know why. I understand your woes with your budget deficits. I just don't understand why we couldn't look at other ways to cut things in our budget to further spread our dollars. We in business have <clears throat> survived one of the deepest recessions since the Great Depression. And we've done it through cutbacks, we've done it through harder work, and demanding more per individual. Now I don't know why we couldn't take a look at that in our own government and help to help reduce costs so we're not so <clears throat> focused on pie in the sky with revenues from this what the marijuana legalization may generate for us. So I thank you for your time for thank you. Thank letting you. me say a comment. Thank you. Sue Sweeney, Bill St. Clair is on deck. And ladies and gentlemen, I also neglected to say if you can hold the applause, it'll enable us to get everybody on that wants to speak today. We have a very limited amount of time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sue Sweeney and this is a little emotional for me, but one week ago today on January 11th, 1964, the U.S. Sur Surgeon General Luther Terry issues Smoking and Health, a report that concluded that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to overall death rate. My father died from diseases associated with smoking, and I hope that it doesn't take as long to recognize the dangers from smoking marijuana. This is not your parents' marijuana. Once the Reagan so-called war on drugs started, the growers brought the marijuana inside and the resulting product is now eight to time, 10 times stronger than when marijuana was literally a weed that grew on the side of the road. 30 years ago, the THC levels were five to 10%. Now many strains in Colorado are upwards of 30%. And I'm just going to hit some of the high points because the previous speaker did mention some of the things I was gonna address. Um, but not enough research has been done on marijuana and there's growing literature and it's all pointing in the same direction. Starting young and using frequently may disrupt brain development. And they found that consistent evidence of both structural brain abnormalities and altered neural activity in marijuana users. These changes may still be evident after a month of abstaining from the drug. And that when teenagers begin, um, when adults, so 9% of adults become addicted if they start as adults, but 17% of those who begin in their teens become addicted. And also heavy marijuana use in adolescence or early adulthood has been associated with a dismal set of life outcomes, including poor school performance, higher dropout rates, increased welfare dependence, greater unemployment, and lower satisfaction. And in conclusion, I ask that as we go forward, you keep in mind the dangers of marijuana use, especially on the brains of adolescents. Marijuana use is already an epidemic with our teenagers, and, is, and it is my hope that we can somehow do damage control in this issue and help our most vulnerable population, teenagers. Thank you. Thank you. Bill St. Clair and Dave Crowley is on deck. Before Bill starts, um, I just saw Representative Morrissey come in. and. Uh, I don't know if I missed any other representatives that might have arrived, but thank you for being here, Mary. Um, I did want to mention one other thing um, that I forgot in the opening remarks. That is, the Committee on Judiciary will be hearing uh, from people in four other locations today, tomorrow, and Wednesday around the state to take in input. We're also holding hearings in our committee this week, and next week we will begin marking up a bill and we'll make a de final decision on Friday, the 29th of January, whether to advance a bill or not advance a bill. Um, that'll be a public vote. It's nothing behind doors or anything like that. So that is my plan. We'll continue to take testimony to continue to hear from Vermonters uh, and your thoughts. So just so that everyone is aware of our uh, tight schedule. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill St. Clair. I live in Bennington. Except for my opinions in the final two paragraphs, this is factual as far as I know. Please inform me of any inaccuracies. Cannabis hemp, also known as marijuana, is a weed. Give it light and water and it grows by itself. 
visit Green Mountain Hydroponics on North Street right next to Fiddlehead to get everything you need except seeds to grow it indoors. You can buy seeds on the internet shipped through the mail in plain wrapping. I have never grown it nor have I smoked it since 1983. And my point here isn't that hydroponic stores are doing anything wrong, they're not. Uh, my point is that you can't stop people from growing their own, especially with modern LED grow lights that don't draw much power, don't make much heat, and are hence very difficult to detect. <laughs> Cannabis has no lethal dose. You can't kill mice or rabbits with it unless you asphyxiate them. This makes it one of the safest substances known. It appears likely that hemp oil, distilled from cannabis flowers, can help heal many cancers and other diseases. See Rick Simpson's phoenixtears.ca website. There have been studies showing that many people actually drive better when stoned. It lengthens reaction times, but it helps focus attention. Stone drivers are more careful because of that. High is not drunk. Cannabis does not cause carelessness like alcohol does. Whole hemp seeds are a complete protein containing healthful fats. They are not psychoactive. I eat them almost every day. I buy them at Spice and Nice down the street. They're legal to import and sell, but not federally legal to, federally legal to grow in the US. Industrial hemp, marijuana's non-psychoactive cousin, has myriad uses for food, fuel, building material, cloth, paper, and more. Because he feared that hemp paper would destroy the profitability of his forest holdings, William Randolph Hearst lied to push through Congress the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. That was the beginning of marijuana prohibition. Federal law still does not distinguish psychoactive and industrial hemp. See Jack Herrer's book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which you can also find online. I believe that cannabis seeds and flowers should be cheaply available in the bulk section of health food stores. They should be regulated no more than any other food or herb. Non-food uses of industrial hemp should be regulated no more than wood or straw or cotton. I have no interest in getting high. Been there, done that 30 years ago. If I got cancer though, I would grow cannabis and distill hemp oil to help me heal myself, whether legal or not but I would much rather buy it over the counter for a few bucks at Spice and Nice or CVS. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dave Crowley, Mary Beth Bennett, you're on deck. Good afternoon. Uh, if we were standing here talking about marijuana having caused 400, more than 480,000 deaths per year in the United States, including nearly 42,000 deaths from secondhand smoke. If we were talking about that, we wouldn't be talking about legalizing marijuana. If we were talking about marijuana use leading to approximately 88,000 deaths in the United States every year, plus two and a half million years of potential lives lost, responsibility for one in 10 deaths among working age adults age 20 to 64. If those kind of numbers were coming up, we wouldn't be talking about legalizing marijuana. But those numbers are the, the first number I said, the 480,000, that's alcohol. That's what alcohol does in this country every year. Kills nearly half a million people. But we're okay with that. Cigarette smoke, tobacco use kills 88,000 people a year. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Alcohol use kills 88,000 people a year. Cigarette smoking kills 480,000 people a year. But we're okay with that. That's okay. Marijuana does not kill. As previously stated, there is no lethal dose for marijuana. You would become physically sick before it would possibly happen. Marijuana by itself does not kill. Just like any other lethal combination, prescription pills, alcohol, tobacco by itself, those things in combination can kill. There's a $100,000 reward that's been on the table since the mid-90s, set by Jack Herrer, the author of the previously mentioned The Emperor Wears No Clothes, for any proof of death from marijuana, that $100,000 is still on the table. 
According to a report from the Division of the National Institute of Health, known as the National Institute on Drug Abuse, in 2014, there have been 25,000 deaths from prescription drugs, 18,000 deaths from prescription opioid pain, opioid pain relievers, 8,000 from benzodiazepines, 5,000 from cocaine, and 10,000 from heroin. Zero from marijuana. Zero. Marijuana will be described as a gateway drug, but we all know that that's not true. There are no gateway drugs. If, as a child, as an infant, at your mother's breast or receiving formula, at that point you realize that by putting something in your body, you can change how you feel. That's your gateway drug. After that, it just depends on how far you want to take that. Please, please stop this prohibition. Don't put people, don't put regular people into the criminal class who just want to relax, who would merely like to sit quietly in their home and not bother any, anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Beth Bennett, Robert Block, you're on deck. Good afternoon, everyone. I support marijuana legalization. I think it's time to legalize, regulate marijuana similar to alcohol. Legalize, legalization will benefit all Vermonters. It will create jobs that pay livable wages, not to mention all the ancillary services um, that will benefit contractors, electricians, restaurants, hotels. Um, it's something that the state needs since a lot of the manufacturing jobs are leaving, especially in the southern Vermont portion. I would just ask that if marijuana is legalized, that it is regulated in a fair and sensible manner, and to ensure that the southern portion of the state has the same opportunities as the north. Unlike the current medical marijuana regulation that only allows for four dispensaries in the state, it's not enough. We need more. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Block, Dick Pembroke, you're on deck. Uh, thank you for coming down to Bennington. I know it's a long trip for the folks that are up in Mount Pelier. My daughter's up there, and we make that frequently. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I represent um, two organizations. Uh, I'm in the uh, board of directors of the AMA and um, the uh, Vermont Medical Society. I'm on their uh, uh, committee. Uh, their, uh, uh, and uh, we have discussed this um, ad nauseum, actually, in both places. Uh, uh, this last um, uh, October, uh, at our Medical Society meeting here in Vermont, uh, we were up in um, Stowe. Uh, we spent a whole day uh, hearing uh, from uh, experts on this topic. And there are um, really, there's one major concern, and the major concern has been mentioned, and that's for the young growing brain. Uh, all the research has shown that um, we make all of our brain cells when we're in our very early youth, and then during our um, 18th to 25th year, uh, the body goes through and rewires all of that because there's a lot of misconnections that occur. And what um, exposure to cannabis does uh, in uh, any of the tests that have been done, and they include in the U.S., uh, and uh, there's a huge uh, study out of uh, uh, the Netherlands where this has been uh, legal now for, what is it, about 20 years now. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, research going on there. And uh, MRI scans, uh, uh, have shown that this wiring does not occur in the normal way. That's why uh, the uh, prior speakers have talked about having difficulty with memory and uh, uh, with long-term attention uh, has occur occurs. And uh, the big concern is that uh, if we make the uh, cannabis even more available than it uh, uh, is currently, that we're going to have a, a whole uh, uh, 
teenage uh, disaster. And I don't know how that can be regulated. Uh, it's certainly been shown in uh, the studies that have been done in Colorado that the teenagers are, are getting it from the uh, stores, uh, that they're not being carefully monitored. And uh, so that's the major issue. I, I agree with people who say that, you know, if you're a 35 year old at home and, and you wanted to have a, a smoke, you know, and nobody should be busting down your door and taking you off to jail. And, I and our, our laws right now cover that, okay? We, we uh, decriminalized a small amount of marijuana. I think that was reasonable. Uh, but we would say that um, there's a, an experiment being done right now in Colorado. It's been three years. There are issues about uh, an increased uh, driving accident rate. Uh, it's not huge. It's not a disaster. But I think we could watch that for a few more years before we make this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Dick Pembroke, Joey Culkin, you're on deck. Those Good of you who don't know Dick, Dick. Pembroke, uh, born in Montpelier, moved here in 1962, was in the legislature from 87 until 2002 on the Transportation Committee. <coughs> I ask you not to take my comments personally, but please take them seriously. I can't believe we are up to this. If you can't fight them, join them attitude. I also don't understand how anyone could become an addict when every day I read from the press, hear on radio or see on TV, multiple folks in trouble after experience that first step. We are hypocritical if we think legalizing marijuana that we are, as taxpayers, will not be paying for the outcomes of their actions just as we are paying the millions that are in trouble already even after attempted rehabilitation. We need to be putting our efforts in a detention system that doesn't cost, hopefully it's a wash, to what it's costing us now. Maybe a work camp similar to Maple Leaf for those who want to be rehabilitated and can be released when they are clean with no chance of repeating their old ways. I would like to remind you of statistics that appeared in the Burlington Free Press this past Tuesday. Just in Burlington alone, and I paraphrase, comparing crime in 2015 against the average of 2012 to 2014, robberies are up 31 percent, assault 22 percent, and retail theft 11 percent. Burlington saw zero homicides between 2012 and 2014, but two men were shot last year, both were drug related. In 2000, the street value of 100 bags of heroin was 56% higher than in New York last year. That margin ballooned to 20, 225%. Here in Bennington, we, ex we experienced five burglaries in two days. No alcohol-related incidents. And the lead sponsor of the Senate bill asking in a Rutland Herald Saturday, what is the best way to manage marijuana? I ask, why do we want the added aggravation and add Comparing it with alcohol and tobacco, there is no comparison. Are we, are we as employees going to have to test every day for use? That is the main reason we can't find good help to work right now. So I ask that you terminate your road trips Go back and give the proposed state budget an enema so that you reverse the trend of increasing the budget from 5% against a 3% revenue source. No more new programs. It seems like every day 
I'm informed of an agency and administration that is short of funds for what they need to operate. <coughs> Let's take care of what we are responsible first. And I vote no for marijuana legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joey Culkin, Amos Newton is on deck. Hello, my name is Joey Culkin. I live in Bennington. I'd like to thank Senator Nitka, Senator Sears, Senator Benning, Senator Ash, Senator White, all the legislators who have come here to the uh, birthplace of Vermont. I don't want to take too much time. Um, and I understand you said this isn't interactive necessarily with the panel here. I would like to just ask everyone in the audience, one question for my own edification to see if I'm right or wrong about something. So if you don't mind, we're an honest society. You don't have to take part in this. Would anyone raise your hand who in the last month has had beer, cigarettes, sugar, or even the harder stuff? <laughs> Anyone on the panel want to participate? <laughs> Thank you very much. Amos Newton, Michael Stern is on deck. Hello, my name is Amos Newton. I am from Jamaica, Vermont, native. Um, I'm in favor of legalizing marijuana in Vermont, but only if it means legalizing it for actual Vermonters. Um, I know that there's been a lot of money spent in Montpelier in the past year or so to, uh, to make sure that legalize means monopolize. And I know that there are big money interests that see this as another opportunity, as in some other states, to cash in on millions of dollars that in the current underground economy remains in the hands of the locals in our communities. Um, this is in effect stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. If we're going to legalize cannabis in Vermont, we need to do so in a way that benefits the majority of Vermonters, not just a few people, corporate officers, their shareholder, shareholders and middlemen. I'm in favor of a legalization bill <clears throat> that stands to benefit locals and provide state revenue that does not have to be used up in incarcerating victimless, criminal, victimless criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Stern, Jim Baker, you're on deck. Hi, I'm Michael Stern. I live in Bennington. I moved here from New Jersey in 2010, and I love this community, and I hate to see what's happening because of our opiate problem. Um, three minutes is not a lot of time, and I thought I had to come right to the chase. What it means to me is, first and foremost, the legalization of marijuana is a civil rights issue. Today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and I don't have time to read the whole I Have a Dream uh, speech, but in my Reconstructionist prayer book, we have a Martin Luther King section, so I just highlighted the bit, and maybe I can enter this into the record. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children. And we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I say to you today, my friends, and even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. It is our hope with this faith we are able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together knowing that, what we, will be, that we will be free one day. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of Vermont. 
Let the freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village, every hamlet, from every state, every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we are free at last. In the last 30 seconds, I want to say that when I worked for AT&T, it was my signature on the document that certified that the international division was Y2K compliant. AT&T had no cannabis testing. A lot of the issues that I hear today based on education, we need to teach our children well. And we can't do that by pro protecting them from the lies that we have had since the Great Depression when we realized that we give a whole lot of unemployed white men jobs busting unemployed black men smoking reefer. And when Nixon refused to get the, the uh, when Nixon refused to let the Schaefer Commission and follow their recommendation to remove cannabis from Schedule 1, we precluded any reasonable research being done on perhaps the most healthful herb that mankind has ever known. I ask you to seriously consider ending this injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Baker, Jim O'Connor, you're on deck. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank the committee for the time and Senator Sears, uh, I did share an email with you a while ago uh, voicing my concerns about the openness of the process um, about the discussion around legalization. And I appreciate the fact that um, you are, your committee is going around the state taking this testimony. I, I want to state the obvious. Um, this is a major public policy decision. This is not a decision uh, about uh, issues around if someone has the right to smoke marijuana or if someone does it in their private home. No one's questioning that, it goes on, people realize that. There's a bigger ramification here. It's a major public policy decision that you're moving towards. It's not about stimulating a business. It's about the future of Vermont. Um, many of these decisions over the years, and, and one that comes to mind that I think about, is decisions made 20, 25 years ago about decentralizing mental health services and what the impact on the community was. And what we realized that impact wasn't until many, many years later. And I emphasize to you again that this is a major public policy decision. It's not simply does someone have the right to purchase or buy marijuana or smoke marijuana. There's major public health. I don't want to reemphasize some of the points that have been made, but I do want to call out a couple of things that were said to voice my support to what was said, starting with Dr. Black. I hope that this committee and other committees in the legislature are going to follow the science, not follow the emotion, and not follow other pressure that's put on you every day at the State House to make decisions about legislation. Follow the science. And you heard it from Dr. Block. We've heard it from, we see it in countries around the world where marijuana has been legalized for a while. There's very good fertile data out there to take a look at. Follow the science, I ask you and I urge you. There's a reason why educators and counselors Business leaders, including the largest chamber of commerce in the state of Vermont, is saying slow this down. The medical profession, you heard it today, slow it down. The debate's been developing and emerging for a period of time, and there's been a great deal of give and take on the facts surrounding uh, legalization. And for some reason, uh, we can always make our arguments based upon the facts that, that are most favorable to us on our position, and I'm not going to do that today. But I will say to you that in Washington, the state of Washington and in the state of Colorado, we are, we are very early into that process. Um, we don't know. There's two areas I want to address quickly in my last 30 seconds. It's the framework that the governor's put in place for him to be able to support legislation, and the first one is the black market. Uh, it, it amazes me when I hear this conversation how anyone thinks we're going to eliminate the black market 
by, by legalizing marijuana, just has to take a look at alcohol, cigarettes, and take a look at the most regulated drug industry in the world, the pharmaceutical industry. We all know where we are in Vermont right now because of opiate abuse and the inability to be able to control that. And my final piece is driving under the influence. We do not have the technology, the training, or the experience in this state right now to be able to effectively test for driving while impaired under the influence of marijuana. It's a public safety issue. So my final message is, thank you for bearing me out, is to slow it down. Follow the science. Thank you very much. Jim O'Connor, Mary Muckle is on deck. Uh, my, na <coughs> my name is uh, Jim O'Connor. I'm a resident of uh, Poundville, Vermont. Uh, I, am, I stand in complete and total opposition to legalizing marijuana in Vermont at this time. I'm opposed to legalizing Vermont, uh, marijuana in Vermont. I'd like to suggest an alternative to the Senate. All right, Vermont is one of the, either the smallest or the second smallest state in the country. If you look at any list, uh, education spending per student were the highest. Other lists were the lowest. We're the top and bottom of every list. We were the first last year to run to single payer. <clears throat> Way too soon, and it fell apart. V Vermont, Vermont is smaller than 20 or 30 cities in the United States of America. We're not that big. We don't need to lead on this. There's only three, I think it's three states or four states that have already passed uh, legalized marijuana. I suggest to this Senate committee and the Senate and the legislature in Vermont, like everyone else said, you know, slow it down. I would support you guys passing a law that Vermont will be the 26th state to legalize marijuana. Let half the country, okay, make the mistakes and suffer. And we'll look at that. That gives us plenty of time. We don't have to be number four. We're little guys. We don't know what we're doing. We don't have the resources. We don't have the money to thoroughly examine this, all right? I personally have seen, and this is anecdotal, okay, members of my family, all right, eventually die from marijuana. As the person said, it isn't a gateway drug. It is absolutely a gateway drug. I've seen 10, 12, and 11-year-olds die at 17, 18, and 19 all right, from overdoses of other drugs. The governor of this state repeatedly talks about the, the heroin problem in this state. If he surveys every person they have on their radar with heroin addiction, you'll find that they use marijuana. All right, now that's not one leads to the other, but boy, it, it, it raises a flag. It ra we don't need the trouble, all right? You have your medical marijuana. Okay, that, you know, I, I don't know how that's good or not good, but we have it but I stand in opposition to this. We don't have to do this now, all right? Let's take our time. Pass a simple law, we'll be number 26. Let's go number 26, we don't gotta, we don't gotta go number four. You don't have the time to, we don't have the time to, to hire 50 people to investigate this and come up. We had the RAND report, which you can use on either side of the argument. I, I read it and you know, if you wanna use it against marijuana, you can use it against marijuana. The other thing is, <clears throat> Vermont lost about 1,000 people, lost population in the past year, okay? There's no in, in new industry coming to Vermont. The manufacturing companies in Vermont ha have stated a position against legalizing marijuana. You think other companies are gonna come here when they, when they think a half our po population is uh, doped up on whatever? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Mary Muckle and Lucinda, if I mispronounce your last name, forgive me, Lucinda. Krautheim? It's uh, Mary Muckle, and I've been a member of this community since 1961, you might as well say. And I've listened to a lot of great comments, and I am for legalizing marijuana. There's many reasons for that, um, that I feel it should be done. I've been actually in the background for over 40 years thinking marijuana should be legalized. It's a shame to think that we're a country that has more young people in prison than any other, even the other, any other country, and that we would really help our system by there wouldn't be uh, young men and women in the uh, our juvenile or in our 
jail systems if we legalize marijuana. And I truly believe that marijuana does not lead to ever other drugs. In fact, if we did legalize marijuana, maybe there would be another, the other drug dealers that are making money off of cocaine or all the other drugs, they wouldn't have people begging for that. They would be satisfied with their marijuana because it is a, me a medical thing. It's proven that it's medical. And so I really feel, I just want it to be known that I, on the books that I am in favor of legalizing marijuana. And not only that, in September I was out in Colorado and I met with some people and they think it's a great thing. It really is not what you all hear. Uh, they said it's not only, they aren't seeing the crime rate going up, they're not seeing any more um, tra traffic accidents or what have you. What I heard was very positive about legalizing marijuana. And I'll tell you right now, if I was ever, di uh, said I had cancer seriously, that would be the first thing I would try. I would not try all the drugs that are given to us now. I would go to marijuana to help me. And I have never smoked marijuana in my life. I've never smoked cigarettes in my life. If I have one drink, I'm under the table. So it's not that I'm doing this because I feel I want to use it. I'll probably never use it unless it came down to a health issue. And I want to thank you for all coming down and letting us have our speech, how we felt, feel about legalizing marijuana, and I do hope it goes through. And thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Lucinda Crothheim and Mary Jane Sarvis is on deck. Hi, folks. I want to thank you also for coming down. I have very little to add from what other folks have said. <clears throat> My big concern is that we protect our young people. No matter what you decide, you have to protect our young people. I don't know how you're going to do it when we can't protect them from cigarettes or alcohol or the opiates in the, in the uh, closet. But you have to figure out a way. If you decide to legalize the marijuana, you have to figure out a way to protect our children. One thing that hasn't been brought up, we will be an island in the middle of two, three, three states that will have legalized marijuana if you go ahead with this. There's an urban legend that folks are coming to Vermont because our welfare benefits are so high. Can you imagine how the, the urban legend will be escalated if we are the only state that has the marijuana legal? And the other thing I would like to say is I don't personally have an opinion, but the thing I would ask everybody in the room to please read the Vermont Department of Health recent study, the report of how marijuana affects your health, how it medically affects everyone, including the children and as we hit our middle age and older. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jane Sarvis, Matt Monahan is on deck. Hi. Hi. Um, I didn't prepare a statement. I just am a mom who raised my kid in Vermont. She's now 20 and in college in Colorado. So when I visited her, I uh, interviewed, talked to kids who were over 21, under 21. I went to dispensaries. I had a lot of time to kill, to be frank, while she was in class. So I did my own little investigation. And I feel quite secure that Colorado has handled everything quite well, uh, except for the edibles. So I will agree that the edibles are, are a potential problem and not handled well. Um, as far as raising your child to be um, aware of the frontal lobe and educational, that's up to parents. I made it very clear to my kid as she was growing up that you don't trust, you don't touch anything until your frontal lobe, or I'm sure there's more technical terms, are fully developed. And frankly, she's never had a problem. What I liked was the students telling me, oh, by the way, be careful, don't drive, whatever you do. And I said, I'm really not planning on it. And they said, be very careful, they stop. If you get stopped, we've been all stopped. If there's any hint of uh, smell or possible intoxication, you get in, you know, you, you get in deep trouble quickly. It's, um, 
It's going quite well there, and I was happy to witness a new building on her campus that came from the tax, this partially, which is paid for it. So uh, I think it's all about good parenting, being aware, and a lot of the things that I've heard today are not the same science that I have been reading for several years investigating this. Colorado has not seen, uh, in fact, the uh, under 18 use of marijuana has gone down dramatically. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before, uh, uh, sorry. before our next witness, if there's other folks who would like to sign up, our uh, committee assistant, Penny Carpenter, who came down from Waterbury today to be with us, and I forgot to introduce her, and uh, that's my fault. She does a terrific job for our committee. If you'd like to sign up to speak and you haven't already, please go see Penny. Thank you. Um, Matt, if you hang on just a second, I want to make sure if John Skult is here, he gets a chance. We passed over him before. If not, Matt, you're up. Uh, ben Simons, you're on deck. Is that Simpson or Simons? I have S I M O N S. <laughs> can't spell your name anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm Matt Monahan. I'm a licensed architect, business owner, and I live in Bennington. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to go on record recommending uh, the state move forward with this process. Uh, there is a uh, there's a, a systemic issue in our society regarding addiction to alcohol, drugs, both <coughs> illegal and prescription. And I believe legalization following the five principles of Governor Shumlin's plan will move the state of Vermont towards a positive solution to our society's <sighs> epidemic uh, addiction, uh, addiction to these uh, dangerous drugs. Uh, I have first-hand experience that has shown me that medicinal plant medicine has cured where uh, mes Western medicine uh, did not. And uh, I commend you with, uh, with your process and I, I believe you are uh, definitely proceeding in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ben, is it Simpson? All right, Linda Putney, you're on deck. If you remember, Ben was a instrumental oh, yeah. in the concussion. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Senator. And thank you all for coming down. We, uh, there's a lot of appreciation in this room for the effort. Um, so, I have just four principles here, really. The current policy of prohibition has failed. So, the uh, monitoring the future survey has shown that throughout its entire history of surveying since the 70s, that availability for marijuana for 12th graders has stayed above 80% that entire time, right? It's easy for kids to get weed. Um, compare that to cigarettes, where we have new public health programs that have been going into effect using money from, that has been taken from cigarette companies, right? Taxed uh, or litigated, and that has, uh, the availability for cigarettes for kids has just dropped below 80% for the first time in 2005, right? Good public health measures can actually affect use, particularly among kids. Uh, from 1991 to 2005, the number of high school age kids that deal marijuana has increased 90%. This is during prohibition, right? Uh, in Vermont, we have one of the highest levels of youth use in the country. And enforcement has gone up, not down, since decriminalization, right? There are more tickets written. The police are spending more time on this issue. And we're still not seeing a decline. Uh, you've heard many claims about health effects. The science is not in on these. Read the RAND report. It makes that very clear. It says this but that, this but that, the whole time. Uh, so take those with a healthy dose of skepticism. Uh, the public health benefits of regulation and taxation of marijuana will, I believe, outweigh the public health costs of increased use. And we can expect increased use, particularly among adults. Uh, 
with effective regulations, like the kind that you're seeing coming out of the health department study that just came out the other day, or the um, uh, Vermont Medical Association report that just came out, if you follow those guidelines and those recommendations, I believe that we'll end up with a positive health uh, outcome. Uh, Anti-smoking campaigns have shown this, uh, like I said, with the cigarette availability data metric. Um, money can be, be invested, these tax monies can be invested in uh, stronger enforcement and can be uh, uh, directed towards research that will help us actually understand the health impacts and public safety impacts of marijuana. And uh, we really, really need, and you all know this better than anybody, more treatment availability for particularly for opiates and alcohol. Those tax monies that come from taxing something you don't like, marijuana, can be used to fund treatment programs that are direly needed in the state. Um, the alternative is more of the same. More enforcement that doesn't work, right? Or regulate and use those monies to actually positively affect public health. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Putney, Richard Dundas is on deck. Thank you. <clears throat> A few years ago, my nephew, uh, who lived in New York City, came up to live with us. And he was a student at Community College of Vermont, um, just starting college. And uh, he took an English class there where he had to write a position paper. So he chose the topic uh, of legalization of marijuana because he wanted to do something that he thought was easy, with, with something that he thought, oh, this will be cinchy, wise guy that he was. So um, he started looking for research uh, on it and, and was having a tough time. He brought in what he had uh, come up with to his instructor, his, his teacher, and she said, no, you can't use this. This is like a lobbying from a lobby uh, organization or something like that. And so he had to find really, really good data uh, to support legalization, and he could not find it. He was just going crazy. Um, so I tried to help him. Now I'm a retired teacher, um, so I, I know how to do research. Um, and I had a real tough time myself trying to find good uh, evidence for legalization of marijuana. So um, he finally handed in his paper, but his, uh, his last remark was, gee, I should have chosen the other side. So. Um, but I also wanted to say that within the last two months, somehow I came across, I'm not exactly sure where, this booklet called Drugs, Brains, and Behavior, the Science of Addiction. It's put out by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And this particular pamphlet was revised in 2014, July 2014. It's an excellent uh, pamphlet, talks about um, what, uh, how drugs can cause addiction, and it gives all kinds of uh, information and, and uh, tablets on the, what it does to the brain. But I'm going to, um, actually I'm going to give you this pamphlet. I'll, have you have it. Okay, then I'm going to read uh, what it says. Marijuana is the most commonly abused illegal substance. This drug impairs short-term memory and learning the ability to focus attention and coordination. It also increases heart rate, can harm the lungs, and can increase the risk of psychosis in those with an underlying vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Dundas, Bob Hemmer, you're on deck. Hi, and thanks for coming um, to hear all of our folks talk. Um, I'm kind of on the fence as whether or not marijuana should be legalized or not, but some of the things we've heard today, such as uh, marijuana cannot kill people, uh, that's probably true. However, that's pretty, probably irrelevant because it could still be a very harmful substance and not kill people. On the other side of the coin is you can't really compare marijuana to heroin, um, two different substances. 
the best thing that I heard today was to um, was the person that said, "Look at the science." And I don't know if the committee has seen this summary article from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, I could give you a copy if you wish. It's called The Adverse Health Effects of Marijuana Use. As a physician, I pay attention, even though I'm retired, I pay attention to the New England Journal of Medicine. And on the second page of this article, it lists a large number of adverse effects that appear to be scientifically proven. I've not looked at every reference, I must admit, but these effects seem to be proven and negative effects of the drug, particularly among uh, people who use the drug uh, in adolescence or young adulthood. Such things as uh, impaired short-term memory, uh, impaired motor coordination, altered judgment, in high doses, paranoia and psychosis, addiction in about 10% of users, altered brain development, we've heard about that, poor educational outcome, cognitive impairment with lower IQ, <coughs> diminished life satisfaction, symptoms of chronic bronchitis, an increased risk of chronic psychosis disorders if you are so predisposed. So I, am, I ask the panel and the Senate and the legislators to look at the science because um, as somebody said, it's, this is a drug that's not been studied well because it's been classified as a very addictive drug for decades. And um, uh, so scientists have not had the, had the opportunity to, to study this drug. And it's only in recent years that I've been seeing evidence come through about the science of marijuana. So we're in our infancy about studying this drug. There are some negative side effects from it, for sure. So I ask you to go slow <coughs> until the science is further developed. Thank you. Thanks. Bob Hemmer and Keith Rowe is on deck. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bob Hemmer. I uh, am a child psychologist. I practice in Bennington County. I live in Shaftesbury. And um, uh, we're having a little trouble, trouble with, with the timer, so. <laughs> oh, okay. You're, you're all free right now. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> um, and and I, I certainly want to echo uh, Dr. Dundas and Dr. Block's concerns about the, uh, the, the uh, uh, effect of marijuana on brain development, and particularly in the adolescent brain and certainly also in the uh, young adult brain. So, so I had to ask myself when I was thinking about coming here, why, why would I be for in favor of, of legalization of marijuana. And I think that it comes down to this idea that there is an uncontrolled substance that is rampant out there. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I had a battery failure. Yeah, that's pretty rampant out there. The availability is, is, is really very high. When kids or uh, adults get this, they have very little idea of, of what's in it. And there have been some bad reactions from other things that have been in it, aside from, aside from the marijuana itself. I do think it will have an impact at some point uh, as more and more states legalize it on the cartel that is doing uh, significant the cartels in Mexico and uh, that is doing significant uh, damage to the, the whole system uh, uh, south of our border. Um, I also think it will allow law enforcement in some ways to focus on more dangerous drugs that have more ramification. I think that the uh, economic benefits can be used to uh, hopefully increase uh, substance abuse and mental health treatment in general. Um, but I just feel like it's kind of out there and it feels like it's out of our control. And so when I was thinking about legalization, it's just like, what are we going to actually do? We know it's out there. A lot of people know where to get it. It's fairly easy. So what are we going to do? So I just thought I'd be, I, I, I thought that was a, a fairly good reason to proceed forward for legalization. I want to echo my friend Sue Sweeney. It is an epidemic. It's international. Um, we need better control. I think we need better control now. Uh, and I just think that um, uh, 
we might as well start calling things what they are for our children. And if we're, if we're saying, well, you know, it's not that bad, well, then there better be research about it. There better be some identif public identification of what the effects are. And if we are, if it's legal and we're, we're working on what that is, as the gentleman, Mr. Simpson, I believe, <laughs> said, um, it, it, you know, that can have an impact on your choice of whether you are choosing to do this to your body or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Keith Rowe, Theo Talcott is on deck. Thank you, Senators. Thank you, Mr. Sears. My name is Keith Rowe. I've spoken with you previously, individually, at many hearings and many conferences. I spoke at the Judiciary Committee, the Senate Committee recently, back in November. Um, I'm for legalization in one way, and I'm for legalization not in another way. Um, I have the youngest patient in the state of Vermont. There are several patients here in, the, in this room today I know of. We are advocating for legalization so we can have better access for cannabis use for medical reasons. Um, I have a book here. It is Cannabis and Cannabinoids, Pharmacology, Toxology, and Therapeutic Potential by Fran Grunthrum and Ethan Russo. This book is done very educationally. It costs a good amount of money to done. There's also a UVM being class being taught currently starting tomorrow by Dr. Dotesman and Dr. Loonsberry here in Vermont, the first in the medical state of Vermont. I'm for your legalization and I am against it at the same time because I believe that there's not enough ways to do it here in Vermont at the moment that you do not have testing labs, you do not have the structure built, and that is one thing that needs to continuously be built uh, upon. Um, and where you will finance that from, I do not know. I understand we're $40 million in debt and that we continue to go. But for the home growers that need the legalization here, I am for it because we need to have access to our medical necessities here in the state of Vermont. We are not getting serviced by our medical community, and especially our medical marijuana program here in Vermont. Four dispensaries is limited. Access to those dispensaries is limited. Home growers is limited, and it is not serving us. This is the youngest patient in the state of Vermont, seen by a neurologist here in Vermont, a neurologist team. Cannabis is used here in Vermont on this child and can be used on this child, which is my daughter. We would love to see access to be able to have legalization for access for the medical community here and the wait and behold on your recreational down the road. If you can legalize access for us to home growers to be able to do something for us so we can have better access for medicine, I'm all for it. But the other access for the recreational, you need more testing. You need more infrastructure. You continuously need to build on that. And I know that you will and have. I've spoken with Mrs. White. I've spoken with Mr. Sears. I've mentioned it to Mr. Benning. I've had conversations with Mr. Zuckerman in the background that is running for Lieutenant Governor. I've spoken to Caius Morris here in this community. I've spoken to Mr. Doucette in this community. I've been throughout the state and show up. I'm still looking forward to seeing how you're going to get that so we can regulate and have more plant counts for us as home growers in this community so we can have better access for medical. The legalization for recreational, take your time, please. It still needs a little more work. I thank you for your time today. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. At least one of us on this side of the table, by the way, likes your sweatshirt. Um, Theo Talcott, Kurt White, you're on deck. Well, thank you everybody for um, coming to and take our testimony. Um, I'm uh, grateful to be here and in support of legalization 100%. Um, medical marijuana should be available to all people. If you have can cancer and are going through chemo and are not don't have access to that, you're really missing out on something to deal with your stomach and as an anti-cancer. Um, the science has been studied by the government very carefully over the years, and it turns out that medical marijuana, it works. It's uh, anti-cancer. It can be uh, good for dementia and Alzheimer's because of its neuroprotective qualities, neurogenerative qualities to the brain. Um, but that's sort of heavy chemistry and a little bit above my pay grade. Um, I will say as a person, as a Vermonter, um, I, I want to obey the law. I want to support the rule of law. I want to be a full citizen. 
um, just as we've extended rights to gays and lesbians. Good old pot smokers should be able to like have rights, you know. Just, we extend the circle. Um, I, I've heard talk about going slow. That's the Vermont way, and I'm I'm down for that. Um, but we we live in a time when of mass incarceration. Um, Black Lives Matter have really brought a beautiful conversation to America about how do we need to change our ways, and we can't. Um, have our public policy born on the on the backs of uh, a perpetual underclass. Um, most of the people in jail are black, black and brown. Most of them are there for marijuana. If we get rid of that, the marijuana problem, we will really have taken a, a great step forward for racial justice in our country. Um, and to me, that's I think the most pressing reason. We could probably go slow for a couple other reasons, but we need to end the prison system. Mass incarceration is a great national shame. Um, as a, just a story about, um, that I heard, this is like science as it goes, but when marijuana came into the community of Hardwick, apparently the fight stopped in the bars. So my hope is that's what happens for Vermont society at large. Uh, maybe the people on the committee could find out the, if that's borne up by the facts of uh, police records and stuff. but. If that's true, that marijuana makes me people a little more peaceful, less likely to drink four beers and get in a fight, well, that'll be good for the police officers who tend our communities. Um, I would say to address the needs of our working class police officers who have to like go out there and deal with people, it's gonna make their jobs easier. Uh, the laws will be clearer for everyday people. Um, they'll be enforcing sensible laws. <coughs> and um, uh, lastly, I'd say as a, a Christian guy, um, as a religious guy, there's a lot of ample evidence that um, cannabis is in history. The Bible has some references in Exodus to sweet canna, sweet cane, that uh, seem to refer to hemp. And you got Moses talking to his burning bush, and who knows what that could have been. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, while we're waiting for the clock to be fixed, I uh, just saw that uh, Rachel Fields is here as well. Thank you, uh, Representative Fields, for also joining us. And thank you, Senator Campion, for texting me that information. Kurt White. And we have Ashley Barber on deck. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. My name is Kurt White, and I'm from Newfane, Vermont. Uh, I'm also a social worker and drug and alcohol counselor, and I'm the director of ambulatory services at the Brattleboro Retreat and the president of the Vermont Association of Addiction Treatment Providers. Uh, that said, m the opinions I'm expressing today are my own and not representative of those agencies, although I try really hard to convince them of my perspective. Um, uh, sometimes successfully. Um, I want to talk today in opposition to the uh, marijuana legislation um, that's before you. Um, I think the work that I do every day has profoundly influenced the way that I think about these issues, and I hope you'll consider that in some of the remarks that I'll make. I think my biggest concern is that marijuana legalization will have negative impacts and that those negative impacts will be disproportionately centered on some of Vermont's most vulnerable individuals, not spread evenly across the population. It might make things worse for some of the people that I work with every day that I'm most concerned about, and it might make my job a lot harder in terms of trying to help them. And I hope that you might try to help with that. I think marijuana is a lot like alcohol. There are a lot of people that say that it is. I think it is. A lot of people use it. Not a lot of people get addicted to it, but some people do get addicted to it. Probably about 11 to 15 percent. <clears throat> the people that get addicted to it are usually those who have used when they're young, or those that have a genetic predisposition to becoming addicted, or who have addictions already to other sorts of substances. These are some of those vulnerable populations that I'm concerned about. Um, marijuana is a complicated drug. It's a powerful psychoactive substance. Uh, researchers are still trying to work on all of the things that it does, both good and bad in the short term. I would support federal research into marijuana uh, on the medical end of things, but I know that's not the question that's before you. For those who struggle with it, addiction to marijuana is a real problem. I've seen addicted families who buy marijuana before providing for themselves and their children. 
I've seen teenagers and young adults drop out of life because of an increasing obsession to use more and more. It's a, it's a significant reason why people do present into treatment and ask for our help. They're not all mandated individuals. Some people's lives really are impaired by this problem. Um, it's not that marijuana is a toxic substance in the same way that opioids are, but the compulsion to use it more and more can be very crippling and have damaging effects much in the same way that a gambling addiction could do so, even though there's nothing inherently harmful about gambling, for example. Um, I'm concerned about uh, um, a good number of other things, too, but I want to just sort of say that the market for marijuana consumption is driven by very heavy users of the drug, and the casual incidental user is, is, uh, an, in, is an insignificant force in the marketplace. The, if we do this, uh, you're going to have for-profit companies advertising to people, trying to create markets for very heavy users to use more and more of the substance, and that will increase the rates of addiction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Barber, James Doolin, you're on deck. And that, that will conclude when James is finished. That will conclude the number of witnesses we have time for today. Unfortunately, we have to end at 2.30 so we can get to Brattleboro by 4. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Ashley Barber, and I'm here based on being a mother. We talk a lot about our children's vulnerability with legalization while my daughter is already vulnerable. My daughter suffers from DeRay syndrome. She has 12,600 seizures a year. This can take her life. When we speak about vulnerability, we need to legalize because the medical program in Vermont has failed her time and time again. She has been the youngest patient for two years on the Vermont Marijuana Registry. We have not been able to access cannabis oil to save her life. We talk about a problem in Vermont with opiate addiction. My daughter is on an opiate. In order for her to come off this opiate, she would basically need to detox like a drug addict. This is not okay. We have a natural plant that we are not using. As based for me as a mother, that we need to legalize to save our children's lives. We need to legalize in a proper way with proper channels and make sure that our community is safe as well. We need to make sure that our law enforcement knows how to push the regulations for this. We need very, very specific standards for our community. We do not need to force residents or long-term Vermonters of being forced to experience neighbors that are growing cannabis that stink, the elderly. We need to be respectful not only for children like my, my daughter, Leah, but for our residents in Vermont. We need, to, we need to legalize because our programs are failing. My daughter Leah deserves a chance at life. She deserves to develop. She deserves a chance to have a medication that she's not addicted to or a pharmaceutical that we have to treat her with more pharmaceuticals to combat the side effects. So I'm asking for legalization through the proper channels. Thank you. Thank you. James Doolin. Uh, I'd like to thank you for letting me speak for a few minutes here. My name is James Doolin. Um, I moved to Bennington in 1986. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force, Air Police. Um, I have a child in the school district here. I also have two kids that graduated Mount Anthony that have graduated college since then. Um, and what I've heard in this room is <clears throat> a lot of concern about our children. Well, that's where parenting, that's where good parenting comes in. Um, kids have access to alcohol. Kids have access to tobacco. One of the biggest problems in the country healthcare system is tobacco. Um, one of the biggest addictions in the country is sugar. If we do this right, we can protect our kids. We can also reap the benefits of this. Marijuana is going to be here. It's been here for thousands of years. It's going to be here as long as man exists. Um, I've heard a couple of people say, well, let's take our time. If 23 states legalize marijuana, the federal government is going to legalize marijuana. Then you're going to be buying marijuana in a Marlboro packet, in a Winston-Salem packet. It's not going to be controlled by people in the state of Vermont that need income. 30 years ago, I moved here, and Main Street was a totally different story. Heroin didn't make 
Main Street empty. Marijuana didn't make Main Street empty. Poor governing made Main Street empty. Bypasses made Main Street empty. So this is going to land on our steps, possibly. If it does, we need to take it and run. Fight fire with fire. I'm for legalization, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate the respectful way that you all conducted yourself. Always proud to be from Bennington. Thank you. Thank you.